whatever he does prospers. So we're going to continue our study in Rooted, theme Rooted, which takes its text from the book of Matthew, the 13th chapter, where we find the parable of the sower. And we've learned so far, as we've looked at the process of how things are planted and how they grow. That when it comes to spiritual growth, many times in the life of the believer, the issue is not the seed, but the soil. And we looked at the various conditions of the soil, which represents various conditions of our heart, in which God deposits his precious, precious treasure, his truth. That truth is designed to cause us to grow up in him and to mature disciples of Jesus. And so we're going to continue as we look at growth. We've looked at planting. We're going to look at, at growth and we're going to talk about pruning today. Growth and pruning. And so one of the things that we need to be concerned about as disciples of Jesus, if we're going to be grow up to be mature disciples of Jesus is our environment. The environment plays a great role in our being able to grow up and be mature disciples of Jesus. And so I'd like to start off giving you a few illustrations to kind of uh, uh, emphasize this. How many of you remember the story of the blob? I mean the movie The Blob way back in the day. And, uh, of course, in this movie, they couldn't figure out what it was, that this massive slime was, and they tried everything they could to control it, but it was just completely out of control, destroying everything in its path. They couldn't kill it. But what they decided to do was freeze it. And in freezing it, they found out that they, while they couldn't kill it, they could stop it from having, uh, uh, being able to express itself fully, causing havoc. And Tony Evans says here, when Jesus saved us, just like what they did in this movie, they froze this blob and then they transported it somewhere where it could be contained. When Jesus saved us, he moved us from the, uh, a place of darkness. And what he has done is, in a sense, he has arrested our sinful nature from having the ability to destroy our souls. By the blood of Jesus, our souls have been set free. But it, we have this nature of the flesh that like the blob wants to destroy us still. 
And so when we talk about growing up in Jesus or growing up in Christ or in, in God's truth, the purpose of doing that is so that we can, in a, in a sense, freeze the flesh. Or that is to create an environment where the flesh can no longer operate and be as destructive as it has the capacity to be. Everybody with me? Let me give you another illustration. How many of you remember the, the uh, TV show, Different Strokes? In this television series, this very wealthy man takes two young men out of the projects, brings them into his penthouse to teach them some, some lessons and uh, teach them or expose them to a better way of living. And the whole thing that made this comical was seeing how th these two different worlds come together. And although you were able to take these young men out of the neighborhood that they grew up in, you couldn't take the neighborhood out of them. And so that's what made it so comical is because even though they were in this penthouse, they still lived in many ways like they lived in the projects with the same mindset. They had to train themselves to think differently. And again, this is kind of what God has done. He's come along one day in our lives and, and he saw us in a spiritual project, if you will a place run down, a place void of uh, really being able to, for, for the people there to experience life in the abundant way that God has always ordained. And when he saw you and I struggling in that condition, he rescued us, brought us into his spiritual penthouse. But ever since then, we have been struggling because we have this mindset that still uh, lives like it's in the projects. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? No, no you don't know what I'm talking about? Uh, where you have thoughts that still, every now and then you've got to remind yourself, oh, that's right, I'm saved. <laughs> that's right, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm not supposed to say those kinds of things anymore. I'm not supposed to do. I'm, I'm in a new environment spiritually. And uh, I, that's right. I can't treat people like I used to treat people. I can't, I can't just, you know, work on the job like I used to work. I'm, I'm now, you know, where I didn't care about what people thought of me. Now I have to care because I no longer live for me but I live for someone else. I now represent somebody. I'm now an ambassador. So when people look at me, I'm supposed to be a reflection of the one I represent. Is there anybody that under, but, but, but there's still that struggle every now and then we have to remind ourselves. That's right. I'm walking in the new life, not the old life. I'm, I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. But again, it's, it's reminding ourselves of the new environment we have been put in spiritually that, that will help us to pay more attention to the physical environment that we place ourselves into at times that can be very hostile to our being able to live up to that new spiritual penthouse environment that our soul has been transferred to. One more illustration. You know, before a balloon is filled with air or helium, it has no life, right? You ever, a balloon, it's small, you know. However, once helium fills a balloon, it has the potential to fly high. Most of the time when we go to buy balloons at a carnival or a circus, we look for the ones that are filled with helium and ready for purchase. If somebody handed us a little wilted balloon and wanted to charge us some money for that, we'd say, what's wrong with you? Right? But those balloons are not flying around because the vendor, to keep them available for sale, ties them down. They will be tied to to something intended to keep them on the ground. Many Christians 
are aware of the power of the spirit that they have inside of them but they are tied down they can't fly high because they are tied down walking in the flesh keeps them from experiencing their potential to fly high And so I want to talk to you about the importance of our environment. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7 says, As you therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And so the first point today I want to share with you is growth is a result of our environment and our encounter with God. You want to see growth in your life? You must do more than just come to Jesus and surrender your heart to him. You must work in partnership with the Holy Spirit to create the right environment for your growth to continue. Colossians seems to suggest that growth is simple. The writer encourages us to simply continue to do the things that we did when we first placed our faith in Christ. So what were some of those things that we did? Well, I can guarantee you when you first came to know Jesus, you had to have been exposed to some scripture. And then you had to have been exposed at some point to some praying. You had to be exposed at some point to worship and to a healthy dose of repentance. So I would say to you today that if we're going to grow in Christ, when it comes to our environment, those same things that we did or that God placed in the atmosphere around us that, caught, that drew us to him are the same things that we need to keep in the environment of our life. What are those things again? Scripture, prayer, worship, and repentance. And remember, repentance, it's not just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is having made up your mind to stop doing one thing in place of an exchange for another. Namely, what God would have you to do. Right? Second point. Spiritual growth is not the work by human hands. In the book of Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, Paul is speaking to the church of Corinth and he's addressing an issue. There is a divide among the body as to who they will follow, whether Paul or Apollos. And so he says here, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you have believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, that's it. That's all we did. But planting and watering without what God does means absolutely nothing. He says, but it is God who gives the increase. And so growth is not the product of man's doing. If you are here today and you are struggling in areas of your life when it comes to spiritual growth, you're not seeing much progress. Listen, you can strain and work as hard as you want to change that thing about yourself, but it will never change apart from the work, the increase that God brings. But here's the problem. The, the, the increase doesn't come until first the truth has been planted. You can't increase something that hasn't been first put there to begin with. So something has to be planted. Then it has to be nurtured. That's the environment. 
It has to be watered. It has to be, be able to receive what it needs to grow. But then it is God who then causes. He activates. Once the water is in place, once the sunlight is in place, there is something he does. He activates. He provides the power for this thing to grow. And that's how it works in the life of every believer. God brings the truth of his word and he plants it. And then he waters it by uh, nurturing it. How does God nurture? I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But he, he, he allows the environment to nurture that word. And, and then he provides the power. Let's just call that the Holy Spirit. Because according to the scriptures, it is the Holy Spirit whom he sends to empower us, to give us power to live the spirit filled, abundant life that he's called us to live. We can't do it apart from his help and his help is in the in the person of the Holy Spirit. Right. And so uh, stop. You, you can't make yourself live godly. It has to be God in you that causes you to listen the scripture says it this way it is God who gives us both the desire and the power the will to do what what it what pleases him all right so uh, if you think today that you can just give yourself the desire to do what God wants you're sadly mistaken if you think that you can make yourself change you cannot do that you need desire God's desire not your desire I want to be clear you can look at something wrong in your life and see that it's wrong but you need to have God's heart about it not just simply say it's wrong but you need to feel how God feels about it you need to see it the way he sees it only then will you be motivated to respond towards it the way God would respond towards it Otherwise, you will only respond to it the way you would respond to it. And how many of you know that sometimes the way we respond to things isn't the way God would respond to things? When we see things wrong in our life, it, God has a response for things that are wrong. It's only one response, and that response is it must go. It must be put away. It must die. That's his response. And if that's not your response to any area of your life that is sinful, then you do not have God's heart about it. It's your heart. And so it's important that we understand that God is the one who brings increase, causes us to grow. It's not the work of man, but that, that can't take place until there's first been a planting and a watering in our life now let's give God praise for all the planting and watering that has already taken place <laughs> yeah but, and let's remind ourselves that we didn't get here because of work we did all right I, I know it looks like that because he used your hands he used your feet. He used your brain. He you come on. You, you, and, and sometimes we get confused just because God uses your uh, uses your hands and your your feet and your mind does not mean that you have done the work. It just means that He's the one holding the strings. That's all. That's all. That you ever see how a puppet works, right? If you didn't see the strings, you might be thinking that that little thing up there on stage is moving all by itself. But I would say look a little further. Look a little closer. Come on. You need to look a little closer at your life. I know you see this progress and it looks like you're doing it. But no, don't you dare take the credit. Give it to the Lord because he is the one who is working in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. Every success, stop and say, God, I thank you. Every little bit of victory, God, I thank you. I know that if it had not been for you this wouldn't have been possible I know you, it had to have been you who changed my mind changed my heart changed gave me this desire to walk out of this situation or this circumstance or even this environment amen, amen, amen. to be where you want me to be we can't make ourselves grow but we can we can stop growth you can be stagnant in growth. You have to allow 
growth to take place. It'd be great if, if we just say, God, change me. In fact, that's what we say. God, change me. God says, first of all, you don't, you know, that's always on the agenda is your transformation. You don't have to ask me to do something I already intend to do. The problem is you won't allow me to. And I'm not going to override your will. I know you want me to. But if I do that, then I, I override free will that I gave you. I'm not going to do that. But I will take you on a journey. And I will just keep loving on you. And pouring my truth in you. And here's what I know. My, the, tr the power or the potency of my word. It is quick. It is powerful. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. And it will pierce asunder your soul and spirit. It will, it will get to the root of the reason why you think the way you think and do the way you, you know, walk the way you walk. And, and in that, you are going to be challenged. And, and I know that in time, if you stay under my word and you stay connected to me, here's what I ultimately know for sure without a shadow of of a doubt is that my tr you are going to eventually see that my ways are better than your ways and when you're convinced of that you'll abandon your ways and submit yourself to mine we have to allow the growth to take place through us you know John in John 15 chapter Jesus talks about him being the vine and we are the branches think about that for the moment you are a branch you're not the vine your job is to allow what is going through the vine to come through you you're not to produce anything you're just to bear it you're not to make apples. You're just supposed to hold them. Allow the apple to be produced through you. Through you. Okay, okay I got to keep moving or I get stuck right there. So growth is not an option. That's my next point. Growth isn't an option. You don't get to come to Jesus and say, I think, you know, this right here just feels really good. I think I'll just stay right here for the rest of my life. I'm really satisfied with knowing Jesus as my Savior, that he died on the cross for my sins and that his blood washes away all of my sin. And, and I'm just really so happy in Jesus. I'm happy that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I'm glad that I'm on my way to heaven. Praise God. I think that's how I'd want to retire right there. Give me my pension. But I'm retiring right there. No. In fact, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul comes to Corinth and he says, and he gives them a stern rebuke. I left you as babes and I came back and you were still babies. I left you drinking milk and I came back to prepare to feed you with meat and found out that you were still not ready to receive more. And the reason is because they, in a sense, were resistant to the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. Can I just say that when you make up your mind that you are not going to study your word that you are not going to be instant in prayer that you will not connect yourself in fellowship that you will not obey God and what he has asked of you as a disciple of Jesus that what you have done is that you have made up your mind to be resistant to the holy work of the Holy Spirit and growing you up now it doesn't mean that all is lost because the Holy Spirit is also God and so he knows what he's doing. He knows how to bring us around. 
to submitting our will to the Father. But, but our being resistant to the truth can cause some terrible results. One of them being stagnation and immaturity. Just, I mean, gross immaturity. It's the reason why some people come to church and they're like, well, I really thought that things would be better here. But I'm finding that they're not much better here than they are in my home or on the job or dare I say it in the club. What, what, what's happened? It could be that, that we have a lot of Christians today who are resistant to growing. They've gotten comfortable with what they have received so far and they're not willing to move any further. Well, growth is not an option, according to Paul. And if we believe that the all of Scripture is God-breathed and inspired, which means it is God's heart about everything that's written there, then when it comes to growing, we understand that God's intention is for us to grow day by day moment by moment isn't that how plants grow day by day moment by moment there's an expectation can I just tell you that it is because of that when Jesus comes we have parables in, 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 in the uh, New Testament that shows that when he comes he is expecting to receive something from us those who have something to offer will be rewarded those who have nothing will be rebuked Because the expectation is that if I have planted something in you, then when I come to harvest it, it had better had come to full maturity. Else I'm going to think that there's something wrong. I know there's nothing wrong with the product. But there could have been some mishandling. You understand? And so... So uh, we, growth is not an option. It is a must. And I'm going to challenge you today that if you have not been growing, that it's time that you start to make up your mind. And if you need help, the right prayer to pray is, Lord, give me the desire. Help me work through. And see, when you say give me the desire, you, you need to understand how God does that. Again, he won't override your will. But as you take steps in that direction, that is, as you start walking towards the area of the desire you want to have, then God will water that effort and eventually provide increase that allows you to be successful in that area of your life. But you have to first, something first has to be planted, that's his truth. Once you receive that truth, you then have to walk in that truth. Walk in in the direction of that what is it that you want to be what is it that God is asking you to be you must stop merely asking God to do it because faith without works is dead you must say God I know this is what you want because your word has declared it and I believe your word to be true now I'm going to begin to take steps that is I'm going to step out on faith and believe that as I begin to walk in this truth though I am struggling in my mind though I'm struggling in my body and in my heart I believe that as I walk in this direction you by the power of your spirit are going to unlock the power the grace the favor the mercy everything that I need to be successful in that area of my life but I do know this if I don't take a step if I stay where I am I will never see that no matter how hard I pray no matter what I do I will never see that increase because I've not watered the truth that you've planted there all right 
So here's, here, I'm going to tell you this as, as God is just pouring this in my heart this morning. Because, first of all, let me, let me see. How many of you believe God hears your prayers? And if you have been praying, God, and your heart has been burdened, God, this must change about me. God says, wonderful. It's taken a good put amount of time just to get you to agree with me on that but now you must realize that you are the branch and I am the vine all right and so here's what you do you don't you can't change that you have to agree that it needs to change when you agree that it needs to change you then open the flow right for me for my truth to flow through you and then you create the right environment for that growth you pray and then you put feet to your prayer by walking in that truth right get around some like-minded believers who also believe the truth of God's word right who can encourage you right and you don't let people in the church discourage you from that because if you do you're being immature right uh, it's time to grow so we 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 push past all of the weeds that might be among us and then we say cuz cuz we cannot be planted in the truth without growth we refuse for 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 us for for us as disciples of Jesus to live our whole lives with no fruit and nothing to present to God And so that takes a bit of discipline, doesn't it? It takes some discipline and, and the Holy Spirit will definitely help you in walking in that. One of the other things that we need to keep in mind with growth is that there are times when we need to be pruned. When you're growing any plant, sometimes there are shoots on that plant that are dead and what they do is the plant spends a lot of its energy trying to revive this part of it that is dying that it takes away from other from the distribution of the nutrients to other parts of the plant if you don't get rid of the sucker You see, because the thing, what's so interesting about this, this, this piece that keeps taking nutrients is that it's taking it, but not getting better. It won't get better. It's refused to allow what it is taking to have any impact. Wow. And so uh, uh, what God does is he sees this these parts of our lives and he comes in like a good gardener and he's saying that there is stealing too much of your joy it's stealing too much of your peace it's stealing too much of of uh, of of the of righteousness and, and, and righteous living that's supposed to be flowing freely through your life and so he'll come and he'll cut that off but what does that actually look like when God begins to prune what is that act? certainly he doesn't just show up and start cutting limbs off our body what he does is he starts to put us in circumstances that he knows he that, that once we go through this circumstance or this situation something's going to fall off something that needs to fall off is going to fall off he creates an environment that is that is not conducive for that thing to still thrive we still walk away but we walk away without the baggage of what is bringing us down and so to someone who has an issue of pride, right? God might allow 
something like the circumstances of Job. Now, that wasn't Job's case, but I'm just using it as an illustration where everything you have is stripped from you. Everything you've worked hard to accumulate so that you see that in an instant, everything you put value in, your education, your strength, you know, all of that. Once all that is taken, what do you have left? And it causes you to think that maybe there's more to this life than possessions. Maybe there's more to this life than power and influence. Maybe there's more because I've, I've had all of that. And now that I don't have it, I don't have any peace. And the reality I found out is that it, because I've had it taken away from me, I can work my whole life and in a day lose it all. What do I have after that is the problem. And, and you, the heart starts to begin to try to, to figure out then what is the meaning of life? That can't be the meaning of life because if all of our hope lies in what we have, then what do we do when we have nothing? If all of our hope is in our children, what do you do when they move out the house and they go on and they don't give you a call? They don't even come by and visit. What do you do? If all of your hope is in that marriage, and I pray it stay together, but if that marriage ends and all your hope was in that, what do you have left to live for? God says, you, 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 you know, you're, that is why he challenged us in his word to store up for ourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust cannot corrupt and the thief cannot break in and steal. Your true treasure needs not to be in man or in things of this world, but it needs to be stored up in your, because of your love for the Father, your love for Christ, your Savior, everything you do, all about them. <laughs> but God will create situations in our lives that are designed to, to get rid of those things that are sucking the life out of us not allowing us to be able to fully enjoy the life that he has planned for us to enjoy. And I would tell you that the pruning that God does is not because he's angry. <laughs> it's not because he wants to punish us. The pruning is because he loves us. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. We prune the plant because we want the plant to live. If we didn't like the plant, we let it keep these parts of the plant, keep on you know, doing what they're doing, robbing the plant of life. And come on, some of you got plants at home look like this right now. They're like, thank you, God, for this message. Maybe they'll come home and water us. <laughs> now I'm only kidding. <laughs> I bet you somebody's going to go home and water a plant today. <laughs> I, bet you, I bet you somebody's going to start taking them yellow leaves off that plant after this, man. I, I guarantee you. As you do, just remember, as you do it to that plant, that's what God wants to do to you. because he wants you to live according to Hebrews chapter 12 1 and 2 there is a race that has been marked out for us to run that results in a heavenly prize in order to run this race well we have to remove according to the Hebrews the writer says we must lay aside everything any weight any sin that would easily get in the way and I think it is, um, you know, when we, when we see this, it, it, it seems like it's contradicting because what we just heard is that God is the one that actually provides the power to remove these things out of our lives, right? And it's, here it's saying we must lay aside. But again, you have to always rightly divide scripture. You have to take what you know over there and apply it to here. And this is how this works. 
because I know that I can't change it myself and I must submit every time I see things like this we must lay aside it's to remind me how it is actually to be done not in my own strength but in the power of almighty God so when it says we must lay aside let us therefore lay aside it is saying let us therefore surrender yield to the power and influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that he can through us lay aside every sin every weight every burden every break every chain every everything that would so easily cause us to sort of be frozen in our track and making progress next point deep roots deep roots produce good fruit so in John 15 4 through 5 he's pruning because he wants us to bear he doesn't just say fruit he says much fruit I want you to bear much fruit what exactly is he wanting us to bear what does that fruit look like well in Galatians 5 chapter chapter 5 verses 22 and 23 it speaks of nine fruit actually one could argue that it's not separate fruits it's not nine pieces because it's not the fruits of the spirit but this word is singular the fruit of the spirit in other words when you bite into the fruit of the spirit you get a taste of love joy peace long suffering goodness faith meekness temperance and self-control because all of it like ragu spaghetti sauce is in there it's in there it's in there this is what God wants to produce and so if you think you can produce love without joy If you tell me I got love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, but that's self-control. God's still working on me on that. And then I would say, well, then he's still working on faithfulness, goodness, kindness, patience, peace, joy, and love. Come on, somebody. That's good. That's good. <laughs> because he doesn't work on one without all the rest you see that is the fruit that he is producing he's not producing a fruit of love a fruit of peace he is producing a fruit that has it all and so any area of our life that we find we are out of alignment in God's will what we need to also understand is that we are out of alignment in other areas as well. And I think that's why we get self-righteous because we start looking at areas that we seem to be doing well and we think, well, we've got that done, check, that, that, that check. That, that. And we don't understand that it's all interrelated and interconnected. And that's why we kind of get comfortable because we're all right with this being controlled and that not being and we don't understand that it's all together and you know what the Bible says when whenever you have something that's all together in the same pot right a little leaven leavens the whole lump so if you got leaven represents represents sin so sin anywhere no matter how much of you is good a little sin affects all of it Yeah, that's why we can't get comfortable there's work to be done there's work to be done there's work to be done there is more of God that we need flowing through us so that we can excel in the fruit of the spirit and that's not just one but all of them 
right? And here's the evidence. Here's what it looks like when, we, when the fruit of the Spirit is, is growing. Now, I, 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 want you to get, you should, I want you to be a little excited here because when you first see fruit growing, you see it in immature phases, right? Stages. And, you know, it even changes color as it matures depending on the fruit, right? And, 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 and so what do you do when you look out your garden and you start to see the first little, little green tomatoes coming on? Don't you get excited about that? Yes, but if you go out there and pick that thing, now, some of you, see, y'all done went back in southern cooking and kitchen, and you're like, well, now. I got to love me some fried green tomatoes, pasta. Yeah. But the problem here is, I'm talking about when you first see the little tomato. You don't go out there and grab that little one. I mean, even a fried green tomato, you want to be of some size. Come on, work with me, right? Hey, work with me. And if you go out and pull that little thing off and try to eat it, it ain't going to taste too good. It's hard as a rock. Right? But you do get excited when you start to see that all of your work, uh, because what that tells you is that everything is working the way it should. Oh, come on, everybody. Come on, let's, can, we just, can we just thank God for that part of, that, that looks like it's good. It's, it's coming about. It's coming into fruition. God, I'm seeing some fruit. It's not as big as I like it, but, but at least I know I'm in the right place. I'm at the right time, and I'm starting to see some fruit because I remember staring out that window many a day just hoping and thinking, well, did I plant it right? Did I have enough fertilizer? Did, did it get enough water? And I don't know, and I don't know. But now when I started to see the fruit, and we can apply that spiritually, how long have you looked for something, you know, to be produced in an area of your life? And, and, and I mean, you've been watching and watching. God, when am I going to start thinking differently? When am I going to start seeing something, a better picture? When am I going to start depending on you? When am I going to start trusting you? When am I going to stop trying to figure things out on my own and start to submit myself to your truth? And then one day you see some fruit. Something happens and instead of your normal response, you get a different response. God says, and it shows you that something's growing. Get excited about that. But don't think you got it. See, sometimes we see that little fruit and we're like, made it. And all you got is a little flower. You know, before the tomato come, you see that little flower. <laughs> oh, you got a little flower. Oh, you got a little bud. You know, you can't do nothing with that but be encouraged. <laughs> Can I, 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 seriously. You can't do nothing with that, but be encouraged. Look to your neighbor and say, be encouraged. The purpose of that, the purpose of God showing you that, the purpose of that first response being changed is to get you excited. It's to remind you, see, I told you that he that began the good work would be finished would be faithful to finish it. I just want you to know, because I know you've been depressed about it. You've not been seeing anything. But, but now, are you convinced that I'm working in you now that you see that, that, that I know it's, been, you know, only 90%. You only, or you only see 10% progress. But that's better than, than no progress. And that's evident that there is something greater inside of you that is working on, on the inside and producing. All right? And so, um, you know, we, we've got to work in partnership with the Holy Spirit. And here, here's, he said, this is how you can know when fruit is starting to bear in your life. Uh, Romans chapter 12 I'm almost done Romans chapter 12 10 through 21 and it's very it's a little lengthy but I want to read it because it's important that we see all of what God's expectations are of us 
because this is what the fruit of the Spirit produces. Romans 12, starting at verse 10, be kindly affectioned one toward another with brotherly love and honoring and honor preferring one another. Do not be slothful in your business, but fervent in your sp in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in your tribulation. Continue instantly in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of saints. Giving yourself to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse them not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Don't be wise in your own conceit and recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things which are honest in the sight of all men and if it be possible as much as lies within you live peaceably with all men not just your brother and your sister but all men dearly beloved and he goes on avenge not yourselves but rather give place to wrath for it is written vengeance is mine I will repay saith the Lord therefore if your enemy is hungry feed him if he is thirsty give him something to drink for in doing so you will reap holes of fire on his head and that is not to make him suffer as some people think but what you will do is you will challenge him by your being good to him. It'll make it hard for him to keep treating you ugly. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You want to know if fruit is evident in your life, if fruit is being born in your life, you ought to be able to do those things right there. That, that's what people should see in you. And not just in one area, but all. All. In other words, they should see you forgiving your enemies and doing good to those who persecute you and giving to the poor and not recompensing to someone what they've done evil to you, right? Being of the same and being of the same mind with your brothers and sisters in Christ and being kindly affectionate to what you, you got the picture it's all of it here's the problem we, we skip something we go straight from you know we bypass transformation I just made up this word okay to trans doing now let me make let me let me make this clear. We think we can look at what that says and just start doing it. Doing things that resemble those things. Here's the problem. If it's not really in your heart, people can tell a fake when they see it. God is after transformation, not just giving you a list of things to do. You go out there and try to do it. That's, that's not it. And that's why many of us don't last doing it because it's not really in our heart to begin with. The way you're supposed to do these things is not look at that first, but you're supposed to go back up the chapter <laughs> and realize that there's supposed to be something developed in you first. It starts on the inside. When you give to the poor, it can't just be because the Bible said it. It has to be because you love the poor. You are concerned about the poor. You have the heart of God for the poor. You see, when your heart's been transformed, when your heart is, and when you're, as the old folks would say, old saints, when your heart is fixed, and your mind is made up 
It can be raining, storming, snow, and sleet outside. But if you have a heart for what you do, for who you love, you will put on your boots, you will put on your scarf, you will brave the weather and go out there because you love those people. I'm going to be a little transparent with you. You know, as a pastor, every week I know I got to preach. It's very easy for me to just go through the motions of sitting down and putting a message together because I know I'm being counted on to do this week after week. If I don't allow the love that I have for God to be my motivation, and not just the fact that I'm being expected to do something then I will preach Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and the gift will operate and the anointing will flow because it is God's gift and the gift according to the scriptures will always make room for itself and it will always operate in accordance with the Holy Spirit right all it needs is a platform and it will take care of itself but what I will not be doing is allowing the word I preach to transform this heart on the inside of me It is very possible to spend your whole life in church and not be transformed by any of the truth you represent. And so every message, I've got to work hard to, to make sure that I am finding myself and that I let God first preach it to me before I preach it to you. And I can tell you that there have been times I, I, I'm going to do this for your benefit, not for mine, because my name will be dragged in the mud probably after I say it. But there have been times I've been guilty of that, stuck in the routine of preaching, preaching and preaching. And, and I'll feel empty. What is this? And God will remind me, well, you've been preaching. But nothing's been changing. And I have to remind myself that I can't ever forget who I do this for and why. And I want you to take that with you, brothers and sisters, in anything you are doing and serving the Lord. Don't ever look at how good it is and think that that equates to intimacy with your heavenly father. It has to happen for me the same way it happens for you. Transformation for me has to go through the same process that it goes through for you. I've got to read the word myself. I've got to hold myself accountable. I've got to make sure I'm not putting something in the way to block the flow of the Holy Spirit working through me, changing my heart. I can preach some powerful word because the word is powerful, not because I make it powerful, but because the word itself is powerful. Can I just tell you, I'm going to make this really clear. You know, you can get a child up here and read some scripture that attend this church apart. It's not the child that did it. It's the word. It's the word. It's the word. The word is power. The word is power. The word is power. And grab any one of you out of the seat, put you up here, get a mic in your hand and give you a portion of scripture. I will bless the Lord at all times in his praise and people just go, ah, yeah. People would be ready to shout. You know why? Because the word is true. And the truth resonates in the hearts of God's people. But it also is scary when you think about it. That we could have so many in the pulpit today. That are preaching. Teaching. Who are not connected. Not even a little bit. With what they're preaching and teaching. 
And that's why in the day that we stand before God, there's going to be a great revealing where we will see the true disciples of Jesus. You know, and not only that, but as believers, you know, thank God because of the cross, we will not be condemned with those who were just faking it. Right? But we're going to, our work is going to be evaluated. Uh, um, what was that? Uh, yeah, I served at the rescue mission. Mike Murth, he came up in church and said, we needed all this stuff, man. I bought two two nightstands, four beds and whatever. And, you know, and I've, I've been serving down there in the soup kitchen and blah, 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 blah. blah. Yeah, I got a problem. Who were you doing it for? Well, why are you worried about that? Did the beds get there yet? Did the people use the beds yet? I, I know you wouldn't talk to God that way, but that's how we serve. That's how we treat one another. What you worried about? What there's a smile on my face or not? You better be glad that I'm just here. I, you know, I could have stayed home in the bed. Why are you worried about if I'm, I got a smile on my face? I mean, give, give me a break. Give me some coffee or something. Why are you worried about whether or not I'm, you know, I, I, I'm treating this person right? Or if I sit, you know, it's not that we're worried about it. It's your heavenly father. He's not looking for robots. He's looking for relationship. He's looking to see if, if the smile that comes on your face is because of the love of Jesus in your heart. Everything you do, is it because you love him and you love people? And so deep roots are what produce good fruit. Don't let pride get in the way and cause you to do good works but for all the wrong reasons. Because none of it, while it does a great deal of good down here, none of it will mean anything when you get to glory. In fact, the Bible, Jesus said it this way. If you do what you do for the praise of men, then you already have your reward. I hope you liked it. <laughs> I hope it was worth it. That little plaque you got on your wall, that little trophy, that little certificate. But let me tell you something. When you get to heaven and see the rewards that I'm going to give the people, you're going to wish you had completely abandoned every trophy. Because Paul says, what is it have, how can it even be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us? You, you can't, listen, stop doing it for, for the praise of men. You want the praise of God. Oh my God. If I get the praise of men, but when I stand before Jesus, I get this. <laughs> And I mean, you ought to be pretty embarrassed because the host of heaven going to be wise. <laughs> no, I don't know how it's going to be wise. I'm just using my imagination. But listen, according to the scriptures, I do know this, that although we'll be in heaven, there will be a deep sense of remorse. Even among God's people, if but for a moment, because it wouldn't be heaven if we had to go the rest of our heavenly lives in remorse. But God will allow a moment of deep, deep remorse. And you will feel the weight of having wasted your time. When you see Jesus face to face, when you see him in all of his glory and majesty. One man saw him and he said, listen, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and man, all I knew is I was undone. I didn't even want to look at him. Listen, when you see Jesus in all of his glory, 
all you want to hear him say truly is well done well done and, and you want to see how your love for him has produced fruit in his kingdom that fruit being the salvation of others who have come to know Jesus as their savior what a shame shame for us especially the church here in America how did we do it how did we let the culture convince us that we're supposed to be living for our own comfort how did we do it I tell you it was a subtle decline it was a slow fade slowly but surely we accepted the lies that culture had to t culture told us that we needed to pamper ourselves take care of ourselves do for yourself very little do we hear the culture telling us to share anything get more be more do more for yourself climb the corporate ladder build the bank account and we bought it all and we brought it in the church the same ideas and you know what happened church here in America we got severely selfish we didn't care about nobody but our own living in prosperity we bought hold of the prosperity gospel why shouldn't I want because God wants me to have it that's the gospel that they preach God wants me to have the best of this world really how does that work when he told us that you will always have the poor with you in this world you will have tribulation and persecution how does that work with that? If, if he wants us to always have the best of this world why don't we have it why don't more of us have it I mean the very best of this world he didn't come to give us the best of this world because this world is passing away there is another world there is a new heaven and a new earth and he came to make sure we got the greatest gift he, that heaven has to offer. He came to give us the best of that world. That world which will last forever and that world to which there will be no end. Heaven, this will pass away and all your bank accounts and none of your money will mean anything. And yet we allow all this stuff to keep us from ministering to the people. And what do we see happening in, in America? More and more people who refuse to believe that God exists. That God is there. Why? Because there's no light. Scripture says if you take a light, a candle, and put it under a bushel. Huh? Huh? What, what purpose is that? It, it, its light is hidden. But if you take that candle and you put it on top of a desk, it gets light, gives light to the room. This is why it's important for us to be rooted and grounded in, in Christ. This is why it's important for us to grow. Ultimately, it's so that men may see our good works and glorify our heavenly Father. You know why you need to overcome lying? Because people in the world need to see that God can give power to overcome lying. 
That's why. It's not just for you. It's to serve as a witness to what the power of God can do. It's to serve as a witness that there is no condition too deep, too far, too helpless that God can't change. And so I want to challenge you today to let God continue to prune you. Let him be, don't be resistant, but rather surrender. When God brings chastisement your way, you know, don't do like some of our children do. When we chastise our kids, you know how they do? I, you know, nothing make me so, man, I'd be so upset. I'd be so upset when I chastise my children. And the attitude is, you know, they're not focused on what they did wrong. They're focused on the punishment. I, I can't believe. that you're doing this to me. I mean, I'm your son. I don't see how this is loving at all. I, I just don't see. I just do not see. No, you don't love me. I mean, come on. I mean, they're not saying it, but it's all in their eyes. I just. <laughs> with every roll of the eyes, with every turn of the head, with every stump of the foot, it's like, oh my gosh, I got the worst parents in the world. <laughs> when we're being punished, that's a, it, the focus is not, you know, and, and, and we'd be sitting there talking, and it's like, and I swear, it's like we're like, you know, the teacher in the Charlie Brown uh, TV show. You ever see, you know, and, and all they hear is wah, 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 wah. You know, I mean, I think that's what they're, it's just like, it just seems like it goes nowhere. <laughs> and what amazes me is we'll still keep doing it. <laughs> we'll keep talking. And I don't care if you listen to me or not, but you're going to hear what I, <laughs> you're going to hear what I have to say. Cut you wrong. But you know, that's what frustrates, what frustrates us is, is that we'd like for them to say, you know what, Dad? You know what, Mom? You're right. I was wrong. You have every right to be upset. You have every right to take my phone or to take my privileges, right? You have every right, I'm wrong, I own it. I throw myself on the mercy. <laughs> now let me just say something. <laughs> let me just say something. If your children responded like that, tell me that wouldn't sometimes change the form of discipline you give. Right? Tell me, you had in mind, oh, it's going to be for five weeks straight. Now it's two and a half. Come on. And here, here now let me give you a scripture. God says, if you know you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more does your heavenly father know how to give good gifts to his if you would just submit surrender acknowledge and throw yourself at the mercy of God God I know it's wrong I know I've done wrong, but I throw myself on your mercy. God, you are absolutely, 
you are absolutely justified in taking whatever you need to take, doing whatever you need to do. You are God. You are just. You are holy. You are righteous. You are loving. You are gracious. And you are kind. I will not allow the punishment to dictate to me how good of a God you are. I know you're good regardless of the punishment. In fact, because you punish me, I know you are good. Because I know that's not what you really want. But I brought that on because I would not listen. Let him prune you. Instead of being resistant, say, I can't believe God, you're letting me go through this. That you have taken this from me and that from me and this from me and that from me. Lord. I submit have your way teach me your ways O oh Lord lead me in the way everlasting prune from my life if you must whatever needs to be taken away that I might be able to thrive in you because I don't want to just be somebody doing good works. I want to be somebody who is, who is good. I want to be good, not just do good. I want my doing good to be because I am good. And that's Bible. That's how it works. I do it because of the change inside of me. Right where you are, I want to pray for you. Father, I, all over this building, your people, we've asked many times that you just change us change our way of thinking and doing but many of us if we are honest with ourselves we've only ever asked without putting feet to our faith God we ultimately know that if we don't begin to walk in the direction of your truth we can never see the increase of it in our life. The results being that we will always live a, a life substandard to what you have planned for us. And God, we pray that you would begin to allow your truth to penetrate the soil of our hearts this morning where we have been resistant in the past. God, would you please allow this word Work on our thought processes right now, God. Whatever we need to believe that will allow us to receive these, this truth in our heart. God, bring increase today. Bring increase. You know where the growth needs to take place, God. Bring increase. Would you show us those areas? And then would you lead us to, through the scriptures? to find out what your word says about it. And would you teach us every day as we meditate on those scriptures to find the courage to surrender to you and allow the power of Christ to make that truth become active in our everyday life. God, we're desperate for you. We're desperate for a change to take place but God truth be told we're, we're pretty lazy too and we just want it to happen without much effort God I pray that you would stir our hearts stir up our hearts help us to see Christ's face again and be reminded that no great work of God has ever come about 
without great sacrifice. And God, I pray that as we grow in our love for Jesus, more and more of ourselves we will begin to see become surrendered to the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. Would you raise up this church, raise up this body of believers to be people who love you and love one another so much so that we will never exchange the truth for a lie no matter how much our flesh barks against it we'll always let you be true and God I pray that you, as you do these good works in us that we stand as a beacon of light to this community showing what our God can do Father, we thank you for all that we've seen so far. But let us not rest and let us not get comfortable. Let us not be weary in our well-doing. But let us keep pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And let us, as Paul says, finish this race. Go all the way living our lives selflessly giving up whatever we have to give up sacrificing all we must so that your name may be glorified and that when we see you face to face we stand unashamed extremely grateful that we have spent our lives rather than save it for your word says he who tries to save his life will lose it but he who loses his life for my sake shall find it release us from the materialism of this world father right now I pray I bind the spirit that folk causes us to focus on things in the name of Jesus filling our life with things we already have too much of things would you begin to cause us to be a blessing to others begin to look at what you blessed us with and look at what we filled our homes with and begin to ask the question who needs something God would you show us that our true treasure is not in our things but in our relationship with you it's not in what we have in this world but what we have in the next Thank you for hearing our prayer today. Bless us now as we prepare to leave this place that we arrive safely where we're headed. And Father, keep us mindful of who we are and who we represent. We're going to go to work tomorrow, Lord willing. God, would you remind us of who we are working for? And that we carry your love, your joy, your peace long-suffering gentleness goodness faithfulness meekness and self-control with us everywhere we go in Jesus mighty name we pray amen if you are here today and you don't know Jesus as your savior as you stand with me to your feet if you don't know Jesus as your savior if you've never truly repented of your sin and invited Jesus to be your Savior, I want to give you the invitation to do that now. If you're saying to yourself, I think I've been one of those that you talked about who have always been in or around church but never really let the truth of God's word transformed my life I am still the same person I was and have been for many years I'm not seeing much growth or progress 
at all because the life I live outside this church really shows that I'm more concerned about me then I would challenge you to consider whether or not you have ever truly repented of your sin and acknowledged Jesus as your Savior today you can know that you have eternal life if you would from your heart not just with your lips you know many times week after week people say the prayer with their lips but not with their heart how many of you know God knows the difference true repentance comes from the heart Jesus said this of his own people once he said these people their lips praise me and honor me but their hearts are so far from me is that you are you only merely someone who speaks good things who speaks even the truth you hear but it's not something that's really a part of you God would challenge you listen I know you're doing a lot of good stuff but it's not enough your righteousness is as filthy rags it is not your good works that brings you to heaven it is repentance Repentance, turning away from sin, receiving Christ as the one who paid the price for all of your sin. That's what gets you to heaven. Nothing else. And it's as simple as that. You must acknowledge that you are a sinner. You must acknowledge that you have offended God. You must acknowledge that you need his forgiveness. You want his forgiveness. And you must see that there is no way to receive it other than through believing in the death of Jesus Christ for your sins. And that he not only died, but he rose from the dead. And he sits right now at the right hand of the Father, giving everyone, who expresses faith in him the right to eternal life he takes your sinfulness and gives you his righteousness in exchange that's how that works but you must come through him don't listen to Oprah she don't know what she talking about don't listen to Dr. Phil he don't know what he's talking about I think this is going to be on the stream. We might want to edit that. I don't know. No, don't edit it. I meant what I said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but through me. That's it. That settles it. I don't care who you are. You know what? One day Oprah's got to bow down before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No matter how much she has, no matter what she's accumulated in, the, accumulated in this world, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. You see, there is no one that will be able to hide. There is no one that will escape the eyes of God. And that is why in the day that you hear his voice, he says, do not harden your heart. So if you are here today and you want to receive Jesus as your savior, just want you to come up here, just walk right down here and we will pray with you. We'll lead you to Christ. Is there anyone who wants to receive Jesus today? Just step out from where you are and we will pray with you and lead you to Jesus. Anyone else? Anyone else? I, w I need to know for sure that I have eternal life. That's it.
I know I have heard God's voice today. I know that he has touched my heart. I know it with every fiber of my being, and I want to be sure that I have a relationship with Jesus, that I'm not just religious, but I want to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I want to spend my life for him because he loved me so much that he died for me. Is there anyone else? Come on, there's still time. From the youngest to the oldest. It'd be a shame. You know, people would die every day. Of all ages. I'll, every now and then I like to challenge my young people because when you're young, you're inv you feel invincible. You feel like you'll live forever. That you got a man, I got time, Pastor. Give me, I got time. After I've done my thing a little bit, I'll come and give my heart to Jesus when I'm about 50 and my jig has lost its jog. <laughs> Whatever, I don't know. I'm not, don't y'all get offended, all you 50-year-old. I'm not saying you. But you know what I mean. In the book of Proverbs, it actually says this. It teaches serve the Lord now in the days of your youth before your teeth fall out it actually says it before your teeth fall out before you have no more hair before you have and you say just as I am Lord <laughs> now listen it's alright to come to Jesus if that's when you found him, the very first time you ever came across him, right? But if he came to you in your youth and revealed himself to you, what he is saying is, come to me then. Don't wait till you, ain't but much more I can do with you then. Can, don't y'all get offended. I'm just speaking to the Bible says we have, by reason of good, good portion of our health, maybe 70 years. 72 is what we'll get to, right? Maybe. Maybe. And that's why the Bible says come and come now. It's always, when is the time of salvation? Now, now, now. Because you don't know how much time you got. But it is... It is obvious that when you get up in age, what you could do in your 20s, you can't do. It's not that you can't do nothing. You just can't do as much. So God says, come to me while you're young so I can get all that you can do. So I can use everything you got. And when you get to heaven, you'll be glad you did. I know I'm going to get some texts after this message. I know I am. Is there anybody else who wants to receive Jesus? Come on, you can do it right now. Don't be ashamed to come to church and leave the same way you came. Lost. Don't do it. Don't do it. One more time. Anyone else? I want to receive Jesus. It's between you and God. 